because in two years, children have not been able to go to school in person. So, a chorada. Yes, yes, Bertie, do you remember that <laughs> word from my, my tour, the street art tour, which soon is going to be coming, the part two, and it's going to be, wow, amazing, amazing. Hola, hola, great. Thanks for coming again. Hola, Sayuri. Woohoo. We have Sayuri in the house. Hola, hola. Gracias. Well, you know, I am following some nice tutorials for looking good in camera <laughs> because I know you have me in your picture, so I have to, you know, look decent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy, Grace. Thanks for coming again. You are invited to as many times you want to see my tours. And I really hope to, this one uh, comes up a little bit shorter <laughs> because the other one supposed to be 30 minutes. It was an hour more or less. So, uh, well, thank you so much for coming today. And we are about to start this tour uh, where people are starting to come. I hope you are doing great tonight. Maybe it's early for you. I don't know. It depends on where you are from. I hope you enjoy very much today's session from my home. Uh, this is a complete different type of tour. If you are more into street tours, I am also into street tours, live street tours. This is going to be something different, but I hope it doesn't disappoint you because the idea is that we use these lectures from home to complete your understanding, your general understanding of Peru's history. These are historic talks. These are lectures, sort of lectures, that I'm going to be doing from home to, um, to go deeper into some interesting topics that you will not easily find in books. Um, you have to you know, know what you're looking for to see, to, to learn about these stories I'm going to be telling you. So that's why I share, I tell uh, that, or I use the, the title, the untold history, because um, most of the time people don't talk about these stories or Peruvians don't even know sometimes about these stories. So um, I hope you are ready to start. Thank you so much for your participation. You are all welcome to comment. You are all welcome to ask as many questions. Don't be shy with your questions. You know me possibly already. If you are new to my tours, let me know it please here. I would love to welcome you into the group, into the community if you are new to my tours. Uh, by the way, my name is Vanessa Vasquez. I am your Lima City Guide here at Hago. I've been guiding for 15 years in Lima, a little bit more than 15 years. So that means that I started when I was five years old because I am 20. Well, no, <laughs> but um, I started a long time ago and now, well, I love to do tours from home. I love to do tours in the streets, like virtually. It's, it's now part of, it's part of my life. I, I, I will never leave it like from now on. COVID has been very difficult for all of us, uh, but it has also helped some of us to reinvent ourselves. And well, from a regular tour guide uh, in, for in-person tours, I became now a virtual tour guide. So I really hope you enjoyed today's event and it has been actually voted for, maybe you remember that I put, I like to put some, uh, let's say, um, votings uh, in, the, in the group of Facebook. And this one here was voted by you too also. Um, so well, today we're going to be talking about the Chinese immigration to Peru. And I really hope you find it interesting uh, so uh, okay no worries maple come back at any time uh-huh so um, if you also uh, find that there's something that um, I'm not expressing myself correctly so a word or something just comment I I know English is not my first language so sometimes I make mistakes saying some things and any mistake is not intentional by the way so well are you ready to start this event are you ready to start this lecture give me a thumbs up if you can or a heart or whatever you have handy hola punguita hello hello Muchas gracias. Thanks for your thumbs up. 
thanks for your hearts. We are going now to start. And you will see that I have everything. Gracias, Maple Please, Thanks for coming, uh, Verdi. Thank you so much. So um, you will see that today I'm going to be using, gracias, Natalie. Uh, slides. Uh, I have a slideshow prepared for you all. I will be also using some other tools. Uh, I hope all of this makes uh, this event more enjoyable. And uh, we're going to talk, of course, about the Chinese immigration to Peru. So how many of you knew that there was a large Chinese descendant population in Peru? Possibly most of you had no idea. What are the possibilities, right? We are so, so, so far away from China. So the reasons of this large number of Chinese descendants in Peru nowadays will be explained with this event today. So um, in the history of the Chinese presence in Peru is indeed very, very old. Um, we have to talk about two important periods in our history. We have the time before the independence uh, that we call the colonial time of the history of Peru and the time after the independence from Spain. The independence happened in the year 1821. So um, the largest number of Chinese immigrants happened after the independence in, what, in the period we call the Republican times. But we have to trace back the beginning of the Chinese presence in Peru before. So we have here a picture of one of the most important constructions we have in downtown Lima. This is the Puente de Piedra or the Stone Bridge in downtown Lima. Actually, I start my tours in downtown Lima in the historic century, usually here in this part. So the reason why I'm putting this picture here is because in the year 1612, two years after the inauguration of this bridge, there was made a census, an official census, the, one of the oldest census of Peru, in which were pointed out the presence of six Chinese men in Lima, which arrived to this territory to participate in the construction of this bridge. So interesting, right? We're not talking about like hundreds or thousands. We're talking about just six Chinese men. But these men came, uh, let's say, to build, to construct, to participate possibly in the construction of churches. We have also some other interesting evidences of the presence of the Chinese and Chinese products. Uh, for example, in a house located very close to the main square of Lima, the Casa Bodega y Cuadra, which I'm planning also to do a tour to this place. I'm crossing my fingers to have the permission to do it um, inside. If not, I will try to find another way to get you in. But uh, this house, um, which has also an interesting story, it was um, in the period of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, a um, sort of like a, a place as wanted by poor people because downtown Lima passed through a process of gentrification. So all of this section was below some shacks, some, some little houses, like ten like houses. And well, the, these families were moved away and uh, they were discovered some evidences of ancient walls. So the house, I'm sorry, I'm going to be using a pen better for, for to show you this part. So the house you see here, this is the house of Bodega y Cuadra. And this section here was the area of the storage of the house. Um, the family was very into uh, the importing of products from Asia. So they were discovered, for example, fragments of porcelain, oh, Chinese porcelain, and also some elements of silk, for example. Also, in that period, in the 16th and 17th century, the um, importation of from China and also workers from China started. But once again, remember, this was a very timid, let's say, um, immigration, not really massive, not in big numbers. 
So um, also before we talk about the arrival of the uh, Chinese immigrants, we have to talk about how we called these Chinese immigrants. And I'm going to move a little bit lower, maybe uh, here, the camera for you to see all of the inscriptions. Okay, so here you can see the term used uh, to describe the Chinese workers, uh, of course, in North America, in South America, in Central America. This is Kuli. The word is Kuli, right? So Kuli, Kulie, oh, also in, in Latin America, we use Kulie to uh, it's actually uh, the word uh, is not Chinese. Uh, it comes from a, a Bengali, uh, let's say, language. And the translation of this uh, word, oh, this is what I've been able to read also. And I'm going to tell you later about the, the book I've been reading for creating this event for you. Um, so the translation will be worker or laborer. And why I'm showing you these pictures here, because they were not just Chinese coolies here in, in, in Latin America. Uh, they were also uh, Filipino coolies and in other parts of the world, uh, Indian coolies. So they were coolies from different ethnical backgrounds. Huh? So, But nowadays we tend to think that coolies were only Chinese, but that was not the case. So um, this is how we also, the name we use to remember, you know, these Chinese uh, immigrants that were workers. So we talk about the period uh, of the colonial times and also uh, still in the colonial period. I would like to tell you that the immigration of Chinese, the first immigration, uh, happened very early in our history. Uh, um, for example, it's been recorded, registered, some uh, Chinese here during the period of the Emperor Wan Li. So you can see here uh, the picture of Wan Li. And uh, Wan Li, which was a, a, a emperor uh, a, a, during the period of the, the early, uh, the end of the uh, 16th century, early 17th century, especially uh, around the 1600s, is when most of these uh, immigrants came to this territory uh, and also other, you know, products, Chinese products with them. So um, most of these um, Chinese came from the port of Macau uh, and from Macau, they went to Philippines. And after that, this was a typical way to Peru to uh, Acapulco in Mexico, and after that to Callao, the port, the main port of Lima. Mm -hmm. So here also I give you some numbers in terms of distance. Can you see here in this section? Just to give you an idea of the big distance. Uh, so to give you an idea, no, the, the distance in total uh, was approximately 20 thousand kilometers. Oh, here you have also, you can take a picture of the distances uh, between each part, right? Um, so I've been investigating, uh, like, uh, for example, in the, in the early colonial period, the use of the galleons, for example, these galleones, these big ships was make it very, very slow. And um, this, this movement of people. And about five to six months it used to take to come from here to here, to Peru. Oh, it make also the, um, let's say, the trip very, very long. So here uh, we're going now to talk about the immigration, but the massive in immigration, the, uh, they say the biggest immigration that we had in Peru from China. And this is the second period of our history. Remember, we have the colonial times and we have the Republican times. So this immigration, the massive one, happened uh, after the independence of Peru. Remember, the year of the independence is 1821. So uh, it was not right away. It happened some years. It passed some years after. But also, it needed to pass certain conditions in China for a uh, 
having so many Chinese wandering to come to the Americas, not just to Peru, also to North America. So we have to take in consideration the following uh, situations. No? Problems in China, for example, the opium wars, which were terrible, and also uh, impoverish uh, the uh, territories of China, especially so far I've been able to read uh, the southern uh, territory of China was terribly affected. Uh, and that's why also most of the immigrants to that came to Peru were from that territory, especially from Canton. That's why in Peru, the, um, the Chinese who were here in the 19th century uh, spoke Cantonese, right? And also another terrible moment of the history of uh, China in that period uh, was the, the ethnic fights between the, the, let's say, the dominant one uh, and one subgroup also, the Hakka group. Uh, um, so uh, the, I remember also there was a, a moment of uh, revolution, the Taipyang uh, revolution, which was also very, very cruel. There were terrible fights. So that's why also many people wanted to escape from China. But it was, it was not just necessary problems in, in China for producing this mass exodus. We also were having conditions uh, that um, invited this um, let's say immigration mm? and these conditions that happened, this perfect storm, you know, that happened was related also with the abolishing of the African slavery, the black slavery. How many of you were able to participate of my uh, Untold History event last time? If anyone was there, please let me know. Raise your hand, by the way. I would love to know uh, if you were there. Because in that occasion, I talk about the African um, influence in Peru, all grasses least. And also, I mention uh, the, the reasons, finally, of the abolishing of the slavery, the African slavery. Thank you, Carmen. Gracias. I'm so glad that you were here also, Bertie. So for you, you might know a little bit better or you can connect a little bit better with this story. But for my friends that were not able to join that one, let me briefly tell you that Peru, uh, since the time of the arrival of the conquistadors, um, let's say normalized the use of black uh, slavery, right? So um, the independence of Peru in the year 1821 promised the black people freedom. So in theory, they would receive the freedom. But in the reality, once uh, the independence happened, it was not actually given in the way they believe, right? The reason is because when the proclamation of the independence happened, um, the liberator San Martin said, okay, yes, since this moment on, no one will be born a slave in Peru. What are you understanding from that, right? Since this moment on, no one will be born a slave in Peru. What about the ones that were born slave before the independence? They continue being slaves, right? So this is very important to notice because, okay, well, at least the, uh, the black uh, slaves, the black men, they knew their children will be free but they continue being slaves. So the actual um, abolishing of the slavery happened years after. Thank you, Jay, thank you so much for your support. So the, um, the actual uh, abolishing of the slavery happened later in the year 1854. 1854. So in that year, the slavery was abolished, right? So we're going to go back to this. So, and it was abolished by this person, uh, this man here, Ramon Castilla, one of the most famous Peruvian presidents of our history. So Ramon Castilla, he declared the, the freedom uh, of all men. By the way, since the year 1821, we did not import any Africans uh, to work as slaves as it was for 300 years, the situation. And uh, also another important thing is that these men compensated, the government compensated any landowners uh, that were losing their slaves with 300 golden coins per slave. 
right? Also, there were there were no importation of slaves. So before the abolition, we were having a big problem on workers on the lands because there were not enough workers, right? Indigenous also were demanding payments. So it was a problem for the landowners, right? We don't have more slaves. What can we do? So he sort of like helped like getting rid the old black slaves. But now, you know, these landowners had money 300 golden coins per each slave they were losing to reinvest in other workers. But now the problem is from where we're going to be, you know, getting these laborers. And well, the solution came from China. So here we can see a, a clipper. Have you seen before a clipper, a picture of a clipper? This is really, really interesting. The clipper uh, where the, um, yes, many, yes, yes. This actually, we have a clipper like sunk in the ocean here in Callao, in, in Lima. One of them, you know, like, uh, unfortunately, you know, like uh, sunk here in this territory. So the clippers um, became actually the mode of transportation. Uh, it, they made actually the trips very, very fast, faster than the other ones before because they were longer, narrower, narrower and longer, right? So it, it makes the navigation faster. And these clippers were used during the gold rush, the gold fever in North America. They also were used to bring um, uh, Chinese workers to North America. And the same clippers also were used in this uh, trade uh, uh, to Peru as well. So, um, it was diminished also, uh, thanks to these clippers, the length of the trip uh, between China and Peru from about half a year until uh, more or less four months, or as you can see, 120 days, right? So, uh, by the way, the name clipper comes from a, a phrase, clip it, uh, which is related with make uh, something faster. So far, I've been able to, to read in the internet. So, um, this is another interesting uh, image. Um, so uh, Cuba, I'm trying to uh, put this a little bit lower. Okay, I think it's going to be working better. So uh, Cuba, uh, back then, is still a, a Spanish colony. We're talking about 1847, was the first Latin American country that imported Chinese to work, laborers to work, right? And um, they were very efficient, by the way, very, very efficient. So um, in that year, 1847, also a group of Peruvian emissaries um, were able to visit Cuba and they realized how efficient the work was uh, of these men. And they thought, hmm, well, I think we found what we need. Well, remember that this is before the official abolishing of the slavery. So the slavery became a problem before, uh, of course, uh, the, its, its final uh, abolishing. And nothing happened for no reason, of course, right? So um, here you can see also a, a map in which you can notice the location of the zones where uh, most of the Chinese immigrants who were coming finally to Peru it came from originally. So mainly from Canton, we had a larger, larger group of people from Canton, and uh, they came actually from Macau, uh, from the port here in Macau. So um, most of the population was from that location. Mm -hmm. So, well, two years after uh, uh, this, um, let's say, discovery of how good the Chinese workers were in the year 1849, Peru sent an agent, an official agent to Macau to consolidate, you know, this um, new business uh, of bringing workers, laborers to this territory. Oh, Kevin, I'm so, so interested. My grandmother came from Canton once. So, oh, that's so nice. Well, we, many Peruvians, by the way, have Chinese blood. Hmm? And most likely our Chinese blood comes from this territory over here. Yes, yes. So, so glad to hear that, Kevin. Thanks for sharing that. So we have here, well, let me show you another. Oh, this is another interesting image. So 
Uh, for those people that wonder to know what type of works the Chinese people did in Peru. Oh, first of all, let me answer a question. I was um, uh, sent it before this event by a friend, uh, Liz, and she asked me about, for example, what was the, the what were the, which ones were the, the H, H gaps, sorry, H gaps, uh, the, 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 ages of the people coming to Peru, the Chinese people coming to Peru in that time, about between 14 and 40 years old. That's the, the average um, gap, let's say, uh, of people, Chinese workers who came to this territory, very young. Actually, we would see this as child, uh, child work, child labor, right? But remember that back in that time, nobody really cared much about children, no? There were many people in the people, for example, that started to work when they were 12 years old. So when you reach out the puberty, you were officially an adult. Uh, so that's why so early in their life, uh, people were eager to emigrate. Uh. So this is the uh, uh, an island, actually. Uh, can you notice this? This is an island. And notice the ocean. Can you see this? The ocean. Uh, we are observing a modern picture uh, they taken made from an island in the coast of Peru, from which you can see people picking up a product. This is guano. Do you know what is guano? Guano is the poop from the sea birds. Bird poop. Muy bien, Arun. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Liz, that's so terrible. Well, I'm, I'm reading also the comment of my friend Liz here. Five-year-olds were used to work. Yes, that's right. I know. In Peru, possibly they were not considered suiting uh, the Chinese that were too young because they had no strength. They had no strength. They needed people with certain level of strength. Uh, they were not needing, like I know, for example, you know, in some parts of the world, they needed delicate hands, right, to to maybe, um, for example, to, to do tapestries or, or things like that, right, manual works. But here we were needing men strong, right? So that's why they had people of certain age gap. So guano, the boom of the guano became very important here in Peru because um, the guano, the, the poop of the seabirds, which, by the way, is very rich in uh, uh, nitrogen and in potassium, uh, was discovered or rediscovered in the early um, 19th century by a German um, scientist, Alexander von Humboldt. And this man took some samples of this poop Oh, in the coast, from the coast, and he realized the benefits it had. It was used as a, a fertilizer in Europe, right? So uh, the boom of the guano started around the 40s of the 19th century, continued all the way until the 70s. And many people were very rich thanks to the guano. So it was needed to bring workers to do this. Nowadays, the people that were picking up guano they only do it for a couple of months and every certain amount of years. It's not done all the time, by the way, because it, it can damage your health terribly. But uh, back then, really nobody cared. Back then, nobody cared about the health of the workers. So the Chinese people were put to work here. Also, they were put to work in creation of an opening, you know, gaps and, and trails for uh, creating rare roads, right? So uh, this was another uh, important word because this was a time of expansion. Remember, we were having mano, uh, sorry, cash from the guano. Uh, so it means that we were needing now to reinvest this money in some big works. So the creation of railroads and expansion, expansion of the trains was also a very important in that period. But also, let's talk about something really interesting. Do you recognize this image? Uh, where it happened? Do you know where it happened? Of course you know. <laughs> so how come Vanessa is adding this picture of a uh, war, very important, that, that didn't happen in Peru? Well, I will tell you my friends. Uh, so this is the War of Secession. Let me move far backwards here or for you to see it. So the War of Secession. Uh, and um, this war 
which stopped actually, you know, North America, you know, like for a period of several years from their exportations because of there was a blockage. So far, I know I've been able to read a lot about this, this team. Uh, there was a blockage, also a blocking of the, um, the ports, you know, to affect the enemy bands, right? By the union, right? So um, who benefited from this? Who benefited from this? Yes, that's right, Lee. So, uh, so I'm right, right? So uh, the ones who benefited from this, because remember, uh, the South in the United States produced cotton, lots of cotton. But we in the coast of Peru also produce cotton and many other countries in, in the Americas. So it was a great opportunity for us to export products, export cottons, right? Even North America needed cotton, right? So we were exporting. That's why this is the period of the guano exportation boom. Gracias, Kevin. Thanks, Carmela. Thanks for your support. And here you can see a picture of Chinese laborers picking up cotton in the uh, coast of Peru. By the way, the largest amount of uh, Chinese population that arrived to Peru stayed in the coast because this is where cotton was produced and sugar cane also was, was produced. The black slaves were the ones that were into doing this work initially, but well, now they were, uh, their work was replaced by a different form of slavery, you know, uh, uh, you know, soft coated, you know, cotton coated uh, slavery, but at the end it was an slavery. Uh? And how I'm saying this, well, um, there was a law of immigration created in the year 1849. We Peruvians immediately started to call it the Chinese law because the immigration law was supposed to be for, you know, welcoming any workers from different parts of the world. Uh, but in, in reality, it was, you know, only made to work for introducing Chinese into Peru, right? So, uh, and these contracts that the uh, Chinese were offered were in two languages, were in Cantonese and were in uh, Spanish. Mm? These contracts lasted for eight years. They were supposed to be eight-year contracts. And in some cases, these Chinese people knew who were contracting them. In some cases, their contracts were put in auctions. I hope I'm using the right word, right? So, uh, to the highest bidder, to the one one that pays the most, oh? but that happened in Peru. They had no idea that would be happening with them there in China. So here you know that you can see that 80% of the workers came to work in the agriculture, 10% in the guano, which was very, very sad because at the end, after, you know, some small period of working in, in contact with the guano, with the poop of the seabirds, remember this is material rich in nitrogen and potassium, nitrogen was so bad, it has started to damage their health right away and they had not really very good um, let's say nutrition, right? Thank you, Liz. Thank you. And 10% railroads, right? So in a period of just 25 years, you can see here the years, right? 1849, 1874, a thousand Chinese people came to Peru and remember the government was partially paying for this because many of the lots of the money used to buy the contracts uh, the the transportation of Chinese and paying the Chinese was actually the um, let's say the compensation that the government gave to the landowners from losing their slaves and what was the opinion of the Peruvians about the Chinese people? Well, they believed they were very strange, uh, yellow skin people with very unusual clothing, very different diet, different language, and always using this, um, uh, I think you call it... Um, uh, ponytail, like a, like a tail, let's say, uh, um, uh, very, very long. So this, these were elements that were very, very unusual, right? So Peruvians were not um, like um, very welcoming to, to people looking so different. Uh, remember different period of our history, different time. So some important things here, you can see, uh, first of all, that most of the Chinese that came to Peru were from Canton or the region called Guangdong or, and Fujian. Uh, they also uh, 
used Cantonese as a language that was their language. And also, that's why in Peru, the Peruvian Chinese food is uh, a fusion of the Cantonese food with the Peruvian uh, traditional food. So here you have also uh, some pictures related with the um, burials of the Chinese workers, the coolies in, in territories in the coast of Peru, central, uh, centralized uh, mainly in the central coast. So, uh, for example, over here, we have a, uh, an, a picture of a contract. This is a contract. And how we have an original, the picture of an original contract uh, here. Well, it was discovered in a tomb, a very simple tomb, made on one of the Guano Islands we have in the central coast of Peru. So um, this contract, and I have a, a little transcription here in this section, but if you read uh, Cantonese, please make a picture of this and try to uh, revise it. So here the translation says that this contract, a work contract, belonged to Li Ju, a Chinese citizen of 20 years of age. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, this um, contract, is, uh, the year of the contract is the year 1855. So it's been estimated that this person did not live for too long after the signing up of the contract. He was very young, very, his, his body was in a very delicate condition, malnutrition. And this is the reason why he died uh, picking up harvesting guano. But we have other examples also. For example, we have here some archaeological findings in an archaeological site. Look at that. We have here walls from a temple, a pre-Hispanic temple, uh, a temple from the Ishma period. We're talking about the uh, 12th century, 11th, 12th century of our era. And here we have a burial of a Chinese worker, a coolie, uh, uh, from the 19th century. So the reason is because in the times of the Republica, people were very, very narrow-minded about who could be buried in Christian Catholic cemeteries. So no one that was not Catholic could be buried in a Catholic cemetery. And of course, Chinese were not Catholic, so they could not be buried in cemeteries in holy ground, holy land. So this is why they were buried possibly by their friends in archaeological sites, because these were places that nobody cared back then. So terrible, I know, uh, because the the state of outcast that they had in that initial time was um, you know, clearly, you know, in all kinds of situations of the life, including their death. And uh, for example, here are uh, the clothes uh, uh, that were uh, used for, for him to be buried in this site, uh, showing also the modesty of his clothes. Mm. So uh, this situation of the terrible trade of Chinese, almost an slavery uh, or semi-slavery situation uh, of contracts that were in Chinese and in Spanish, but most likely uh, not really similar in one side or the other, um, or, or let's say with lots of empty spaces, you know, because people had no idea where they were actually ending up in this country, in Peru, all of this is, uh, uh, situation ended in the year 1872 with an, a scandal, an international uh, scandal that happened in Japan, actually. A ship that was coming from the Chinese port of Macau in direction to Peru had to uh, stop in Yokohama. And uh, we don't know how, but one of the Chinese men on board escaped from the ship and he uh, told the authorities about the mistreatments he was receiving and his uh, friends also in this ship, possibly the assassination, possibly the uh, bad food they were receiving, all the promises given that, well, didn't happen. So immediately after this became, you know, a, a boom and uh, we had to stop this form of in slavery, actually, uh, um, with a treaty. No? So also China, you know, uh, called for a conversation. And finally, in the year 1874, two years after, uh, we signed up a treaty, a pact of 
friendship, right? So this friendship has stopped this form of uh, immigration and control it better. Mm -hmm. So we will also continue. Grace is commended. Must be poor and significant. Most wanted their bones to return back. Well, actually, dear Grace, um, most of these people that were buried here in this condition, these Chinese men workers, they were uh, buried and nobody could reclaim their bodies because there was no knowledge of where they were from actually the workers they uh, the friends they made um in in their in the plantation fields they were made friends just because they were in the same situation working and many of these men never returned to china to say to tell the the relatives of this person where the body was so that's why these bodies stay here were forgotten right um, so we have here a image of a terrible situation, a terrible war we had in Peru. This is the War of the Pacific, uh, also known as the War Peru-Chile, that uh, was very long, but also it ruined, it ruined the economy of Peru and the economy of many Chinese men whom after finishing their contracts, uh, they possibly found out, you know, like um, a, a wife, a woman to live with, most likely an indigenous woman uh, a, and form families and make businesses, initial small businesses. Uh, the war came and destroyed everything. The immigration of uh, Chinese continued after the year 1874, but um, it was not as massive. So um, this is this is a very interesting period of our history because we were so poor after the war that actually damaged our economy. Terrible, terrible. So um, in the year 1881, the Chileans took Lima and destroyed the city. But also, let me tell you one interesting story. Many Chinese that were uh, newcomers, new immigrants uh, that were working as coolies uh, in, in that period, and then, you know, they stayed here in Peru because they were so poor and they were very mistreated. They supported the, Ch the Chilean troops. They were as a scouts. Uh, to help the Chilean troops uh, to, to find out their way into Lima. So look at that resentment, right? Look at the resentment uh, and we deserve it because the treatment we gave to those workers was very, very bad. Actually, one of the Ch Chilean militars, Mr. Uh, Patricio Lynch, he also supported the British in the war of the opium, the opium war, and he was very fluent in Cantonese. And he went to the heart of the Chinese because he spoke his language, something we didn't, right? So keep that in mind. Of course, now we see it, you know, from a different perspective, but you can imagine the Peruvians started, they had a xenophobic feeling against the Ch uh, Chinese because they knew many supported Chile. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Muchas gracias. Yes. Um, so I'm seeking also, I'm seeing some comments. How do you call the sentence Kuli in Spanish? Oh, in a moment, I'm going to bring this. Oh, thank you, Carmela, for your question. Here, I think you have the answer. So Tusan is the descendant of the Chinese. I think uh, Grace also uh, pointed out here in the, in the chat. Tusan, we don't uh, have different names for first generation, second generation. No, it's uh, all all of the descendants. If you have a quarter of blood Chinese, you know, an eighth of the blood Chinese, you are still Tucson. Also, other words, chifa. What is chifa? It's the Peruvian Chinese food. And it comes from the word chifang. Chifang means uh, in Cantonese, uh, cook rice. Oh, so, uh, and it's also used as an invitation oh, to, to eat. Actually, uh, in the 19th century, when the first Chinese started to do businesses around food in downtown Lima, uh, near the central market, they used to meet that with their paisanos, we call with their, you know, like um, other Chinese people, uh, and they greet each other and they say, Chifang. Oh, Chifang is sort of like a greeting to, it's an invitation to eat together. And they right after went to eat at a restaurant, right? So the people, Peruvian people started to think that the word Chifa, they were saying, was the name of the food they were eating. That's why we call the Peruvian Chinese restaurant Chifa, right? So, and we have another famous word, Chaufa. 
we have a uh, chaufa rice uh, that is delicious and it comes from the word chaufang which means fried rice oh gracias Kevin <laughs> I've been practicing <laughs> So, and we have some of the most delicious, most famous dishes we have in Peru, the, in the Chifa restaurants. Uh, maybe some of these words uh, are, um, uh, let's say, um, something you can recognize, but don't think it's the same food you have in, in China, for example, in Singapore, in North America, because the Chinese food has adapted everywhere it has gone, right? So, for example, the canlu wantan, the arroz chaufa, the chihau kai, the sopa wantan, they are the most solicited dishes here in Peru when we go to a chifa. But in this slide, you're going to see dishes that you will never find in any Chinese, American, Chinese, Italian, I don't know, any, any restaurants around the world that are Chinese. And this is because these are fusion cuisine. And I hope you like this uh, part because you can see, for example, the famous lomo saltado, the stir fry uh, beef saute with uh, potatoes, with French fries, with onions, tomatoes. Well, I have a cooking class how to make this. So I hope when I bring it soon, you will be joining to that one. This one here is also really interesting. This is the lemon kai chicken. And the lemon kai chicken, look at the sauce here. This sauce you see here, yellowish, is made from Inca cola. Do you know what is the Inca cola? Do you know? <laughs> Have you ever heard about it? <laughs> Inca cola is the Peruvian soda. It, it tastes like bubble gum and it's delicious. And we use Inca cola as some recipes has Coca-Cola, right? Uh, we use Inca Cola to do this sauce, right? This is delicious. And also this one here, this is the Chi Hao Kui, the Chi Hao Kui. So who can tell me what Kui means? Do you know what is the meaning of this word? Let me know here in the comment section. The Chi Hao Kui, is, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you do, unfortunately. In Peru, we eat guinea pig. And guinea pig is a pre-Hispanic tradition that we still carry. We had no chicken in the pre-Hispanic times, no beef, um, no pork. So there were just uh, guinea pigs, alpacas, and llamas. But besides some old foods that are not anymore consumed. So this is why in Peru, we continue having this tradition. And look at the Chinese tradition fusion with the Peruvian original tradition. Mm -hmm. So we have also some other interesting elements here in Lima that reminds us the good relation that now we have with the Chinese because nowadays approximately 10% of the population of Peru is Chinese descendant. Can you imagine that? So in Peru we have 31 million people and about over 3 million Peruvians claim to be descendants of Chinese. And you can actually see all uh, the, the almond-shaped eyes. You can see elements, their last names also, uh, that associate them with the Chinese culture, Chinese immigration. So here we have the first one. Uh, this is the Chinese fountain. It was a present from the Chinese community to Peru for the celebration of the 100 years of the independence of Peru. Uh, so um, do we have pure Chinese people? Grace, uh, from that first generation, no, because remember, there were mainly men, like 99% were was men in migration, so they mix to survive, of course. But nowadays, we have lots of Chinese immigrants who came to establish restaurants, for example, and this, they are, of course, pure 100%. Chinese. Mm -hmm. But Peru is the land of the fusion of cultures, the fusion of bloods. Mm -hmm. So this is the Chinese fountain from 1921. And we have also another important space in Lima. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, all my friends that are supporting this tour with your tip. It is uh, making possible for, for me to continue doing these events for you. Gracias, gracias. So we have here uh, the Chinese gate at the Calle Capon or the Capon Street. This is the Chinatown. And soon I'm going to be going back to the Chinatown. So I hope you would like to join that one. That will be a street tour, actually, like the regular ones I do. Um, so, uh, but it's going to be soon. So if you want to go there, let me know if, if, if you would join it, please. Uh, that would be lovely. So 
uh, here in this section, there is a sign, which uh, unfortunately at that time in the day, the light didn't help me. Uh, but it says the translation, under the sky, all men are equal. What a beautiful sign. Uh, the gate uh, was um, made uh, for the commemoration of the uh, 150 years of the independence of Peru in the year 1971. Uh, but the street, the decoration in the street here, it looks very, very Asian, very, very Chinese. Uh, it was made in 1999, no? so to commemorate the immigration uh, from China, the beginning of the immigration with the first ship with 75 Chinese who came to Peru uh, in uh, the year 1849. So, um, so by the way, the Calle Capon, the word Capon, uh, Capon is not in Chinese. Uh, the reason why we call our Chinatown Calle Capon is because the word Capon comes from the Spanish capar or caponar, which means to castrate. <laughs> and this is because this was a way that, uh, for example, many Chinese people that had their animals there, that had the restaurants, they found to make the pores, for example, be fatter, uh, like uh, accumulate more fat, cast castrating. Oh, so this is why uh, this was the section where the animals were castrated. And also, please help me to, to know which one of these themes you would like me to cover next time. Um, I have these two themes. One is the secret Jewish community of Lima in the 16th and 17th century, and the other of is the Japanese immigration to Peru. Let me know if you were uh, would be interested in one of these. If you can, please comment here in the comment section, or you can also do it in uh, Facebook, in the Hago uh, Voyagers um, of uh, Facebook. I have a, a little, um, let's say, uh, um, let's say I, 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 I put a question so you can actually comment there. You can choose there. Uh, so Capone is also an old-fashioned English term for a customer. Oh, really, Liz? That's really interesting. So um, you are understanding also the, the word capon, right? That's fantastic. Uh, so I'm so happy that uh, Liz and Verity would like to do both. And the event has finished here at this point. Uh, uh, I hope you enjoy it. I have a little bonus. I don't know if you would like to um, uh, also join me if you have some few minutes because I want to share with you also some videos of how the uh, Calle Capon looks like. I don't know if you would like to, to see this. Um, it would be lovely to show you a, a little bit of these um, uh, images. It's from um, YouTube. So if you have some few minutes uh, to share with me, um, please join to this bonus. It would be, it would be lovely. Let me turn lower the volume here. Uh, and also, uh, you can say yes, 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 Yuri. Uh, Liz, thank you so much. Thanks to all my friends that are supporting this tour with a tip. I have a bonus for you. So um, let me put also this, this section where I'm going to be um, showing the Calle Capon. If you were not able to see it before, so, let me show you uh, uh, how it looks. And this is, by the way, the um, image. I'm going to put a stop here. Okay. So this is the image. Thank you. Thanks for staying with me uh, of the arch. If you would like to, if you read uh, Chinese, Cantonese, uh, let me know if you understand, of course, what is here. This is the section where it says, under the sky, all men are equal. Mm-hmm. And here you can see also the street Calle Capon, the Chinatown, and how nicely it looks from above. It has all the style, the looks of a traditional uh, Chinese uh, street. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have also... Well, some stands in which you can find uh, like lots of souvenirs and elements associated with the Chinese culture. And here you can see also that the Chinese horoscope uh, is a display also for people to just come and take pictures of themselves here. We have also excellent restaurants, uh, chief of restaurants in this section. So it is really, really nice place to. Hang out. And I don't know if you would like me to take you here. 
Uh, I think it would be really fun to come back with you all to see how this place uh, is. Uh, and maybe we can go to eat some chifa. I don't know. Would you like it? <laughs> so, and here I want to also share with you another quick video just to show you how the uh, fountain and the, the park where the fountain is looks like. So just let me show you this one. Sorry for um, not showing you. Just give me a second. There's always ads coming. <laughs> so I hope you, you had a, a fun time with me. Bertie, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your support. So um, by the way, the place, uh, the videos I'm using are uh, in uh, YouTube. They are not mine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to start doing some videos. I've been watching lots of tours from my friend Itamar uh, in Israel, and I've been very, very inspired by him. So I'm going to be soon doing some, my own videos to show you different places in Lima that maybe we cannot go uh, to do a tour. And I'm going just straight to where the fountain is. Okay, so... Okay, I think we can see here. The park where the fountain is, is called the Exposition Park. And this is because we had a big expo in the year 1872 in this place. And there were many buildings uh, made for that exposition. But remember that the fountain is from 1921, so it's a little bit later, actually. So um, this is a really beautiful fountain. It was made in Italy, paid by the money of the Chinese people, the Chinese descendants for a second generation uh, that lived in Lima back then. And this, this also proves that although it, this was a harsh starting, uh, but they were very thanked for the opportunities later given to them, for the families they formed in Peru, for the businesses uh, they made here, for the, uh, for the opportunity of being in this nation. No? So uh, honestly, this is, this is very hard touch right because they were not really welcome in the beginning and they gave us in return hard work they gave us in return wonderful businesses they gave us in return the amazing food we have that we call chifa so well this is a little bit of what I had to share with you today. So sorry for extending this tour again, <laughs> but I really hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much for coming here to Lima, virtually to my home, to my humble house. And um, also, well, I'm going to be preparing something really interesting for next time. So please vote, vote uh, about which one you would like to have for next time, which is going to be in two weeks. I take my time to prepare these events really nicely. So, um, well, and, and take care. Please come to our tours in Latin America. Sayuri here has lovely sunset tours. Well, she does lovely everything. So please follow Sayuri in her channel. Follow my friends here in Latin America, in North America, um, help us uh, to continue doing great things like with your support, with your presence, uh, the sky is the limit. Uh, so muchas gracias and God bless you all. Gracias. Maple, I will tell Luis Alberto, my brother, I will tell him uh, that you send also love. And um, see you soon. See you very, very soon. In a couple of days, I'm going to have a, a tour to Miraflores. Join me to have a, a nice sunset. We're going to be chatting a lot. You are all invited. And join me earlier that day on the 16th to pet some cats because we're going to the famous park of the cats. So come to Lima, you know, there are many reasons to come, uh, and well, all the best to you, gracias a Yuri for, that's my channel, by the way, if you would like to see what's coming next, so click there, give me a follow, and see you very soon, best to you, God bless you all, lots of love, bye-bye, muchas gracias, if you would like to support me here, just to let you know, there, where you saw the activated button, there is where you can do it, muchas gracias, thanks on behalf also of HeyGo for your tip support. Take care. Bye-bye.